good afternoon. This is Brian Kent from the Association of Vermont Credit Unions. I wanted to thank everybody for taking the time to join us this afternoon uh, for the session that we have. Just to kind of lay a little bit out of the format, um, with the help of DBOL, and we're very appreciative of their time and assistance, uh, we know there's been a number of changes that have been coming in the ATM world and maintenance environment uh, over the last years. And those are going to do everything from PCI compliance type rules to issues that are kind of coming up in regard to EMV. And this is a good opportunity for us, and I think DBOL appropriately titled today's session, uh, Compliance Checkpoint, Where You're in the Journey. Um, with the assistance of uh, DBOLD, we have Heather Reynolds, and we also have Dean Stewart, the Senior Director of Advanced Solutions Product Management from DBOLD, assisting us with the session. And that's pretty much our goal, is kind of where are we in the journey. And in a few minutes, I'll be turning it over to them, but our thought today is we want to tap into their expertise to make sure that we can touch on the key points in terms of what's happening with the guidelines, what are the timelines that we've been going back and forth, uh, as well as address some of the what-if issues. Uh, for example, if you're thinking about uh, changing your ATM so it can accept EMV card transactions, what does that mean? What are some other type of ramifications? What are the timelines and everything that you should have for a default with that? We anticipate that today's session is going to last approximately an hour, and that'll include the Q&A session that we have scheduled after the PowerPoint complete the session. And two other things I wanted to mention before I turn things over to Heather. Uh, who will give you some details of how this session is going to work. One is, uh, for our association members, we're also doing a re-recording of this session on live stream. So for those of you who have used live stream in the past, you'll see this added to our live stream library. And DBOLD is also going to be sending a recording of this link to us, and we'll have both formats available. Uh, also, the situation that we're facing here in Vermont of helping our credit unions of where they are in the journey is not dissimilar from what we're seeing in other states. Uh, we're very much open in terms of the situation of extending the invite uh, with DBOL to have other credit unions that they have talked to on the line. So a couple times today, you may see a question or comment that'll come in from a surrounding New England area credit union, uh, which, you know, wanted to join on today's call. And we were more than happy to help them out as well, and glad that we could work with DBOL to provide that benefit. So I'm going to turn it briefly over to Heather, who will give you some uh, indications of uh, just how the format is going to run. And Heather, it's my understanding you're going to give a brief bio overview of Dean Stewart before Dean takes it and runs us through today's session. Again, when it concludes, uh, we are going to have the opportunity for Q&A. Um, but during Dean's part and Heather's overview, your lines will be muted. So Heather, I'll let you take it from here. Okay, thank you, Brian, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to join us. And as Brian mentioned, our presentation will last approximately 50, or approximately 30 minutes, and then we'll have time at the end for questions. Your phone lines will remain muted, so you will need to use the Q&A feature in the lower right-hand corner of your screen to submit your questions. We'll then read those and answer those at the end. All right, today's session is being recorded and a link will be provided in a follow-up email from DBOLD tomorrow along with the presentation slide deck. Okay, um, as you can see here, Dean Stewart is our Senior Director of Core Solutions Product Management. Um, Dean is uh, very well versed and has hosted um, all of our Operation 411 webinars this year. Um, so at this time, we're gonna go ahead and turn the presentation over to Dean. Thank you very much, Heather, and, and thank you, Brian, and everyone for allowing us to participate today. It's our pleasure to be here. Um, as Brian mentioned, there is a lot of change in the self-service channel. Uh, running a, an ATM channel is really an education and change management. It happens all the time. Uh, the near future is not going to be any different. Uh, we're going to continue to see a number of impacts in the market um, from the payment card industry, compliance changes, government regulations. Uh, and as well as changes to technology uh, and even changes from supplier supported impacts that we'll talk about. Um, and so we put this, pr this uh, program together called Operation 411 to give you the information you need to navigate around all these decisions and, and make some plans and designs for what it is that you'll need to do in the future. And part of our presentation or our goal today is to walk you through some of these important changes to help you get that education and start to plan for those changes as they come forward. So the, the first thing that I'd like to do is put this into perspective for you with a, a look at a timeline of some crucial dates 
that are out there. Uh, both There are a few in the past, and there are several in the future that we wanted to look at. But throughout uh, in, in 2012, obviously, we saw a, a big impact from the Americans with Disabilities Act, and a lot of changes took place there. But in April of, of uh, 2013, we started to see the impact of EMV, uh, both with changes at point of sale and ATM, particularly on, on out of the U.S. or foreign transactions that would be acquired at ATMs. And, and that was really the first in the beginning of EMV, which brought it onto the radar in the U.S. And we'll talk, uh, or I'm sorry, we'll see more changes coming in that direction uh, in 2015 and 2016. What I really want to call your attention to today really is April of 2014, the second column uh, in this calendar, where uh, two important regulatory changes will take place. The, the first is that Microsoft ends support for Windows XP in early April. This is a significant change for the industry since 90% plus ATMs in the market today run some version of Windows XP, and at that point, will no longer be supported from Microsoft. So we'll, we'll see no more enhancements, we'll see no more security patches, bug fixes, or uh, corrections of, of any kind, and we'll talk about that more in detail. Uh, also in April, a change to the PCI compliance rules is that the encrypting pin pad used on Diebold ATMs conforms to a PCI standard called PCI 1.5, which expires in April, and will from that, day, from that month forward, EPPs will be required to comply with PCI 3.0 standard, which means we're introducing a new piece of hardware into the ATMs in April. Physically, it looks the same to your customers as you have today, but it does have a few technical differences uh, that will come into play, and you'll need to be prepared for that as well. So I'm going to focus a little bit more on the April 2014 as we go through this presentation, but as we get to the end, we'll talk about a few other items around uh, EMV or any other questions that you might have. So as I always like to start, because I'm often asked, well, with all of these changes coming, what do you recommend that the ATMs have to be uh, positioned for, or what's the hardware that I need to address all of these issues? So this list shows our recommendations for uh, Diebold ATMs and, and what processing power you'll need. So briefly, um, our latest shipping processor in ATMs today is a Core 2 Duo 3 gigahertz processor. Our code name for it is commonly referred to as the Sierra processor. If you have that processor, you are fine. If you have one generation back from that, known as Denver, that will work as well. But we recommend the Sierra. Um, four gigabytes of memory is recommended. Uh, and then, of course, the Windows 7 license to, to be able to migrate to Windows 7. Um, for about the last year plus, we have been um, supplying uh, actually longer than that, almost two years now that I think about it, we have been supplying a Windows 7 license with XP downgrade rights. There will be some changes to your transaction host processing software or the network, such as Vantif, for example, to support EMV transactions. Uh, and some software updates might be necessary to support that as well. If, if, the, if you have a current version of Agilus 3 and you're moving just to support EMV, uh, a minor software enhancement to add the EMV kernel would be necessary. It's important to note that I and IX series ATMs, these are the machines that were sold in the marketplace in the 80s and 90s, will not be supported under Windows 7. Okay, so I want to briefly kind of go through some of the benefits and risks of the migration to Windows 7. It's usually the biggest topic that we have because it impacts uh, just about every ATM in the marketplace, usually brings the most questions with it. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the benefits and the plan necessary there. So what are the benefits? Why do I want to move to Windows 7? Why don't I just stay where I am today? So some of the things to consider is that you need to stay up to date. Uh, Microsoft stops support for XP, and that means that they will not be adding any future enhancements to it. So any technology changes that come along will not be supported by Microsoft on that platform, which means they won't be supported on your ATMs, which eventually will put you in a position of a machine that will be very expensive to maintain uh, because you'll be getting, um, you'll be left behind by not just the, the Microsoft supplier, but in, in the case of some of the componentry that goes in that ATM, like audio cards or video card support or even memory, things of that nature, uh, will no longer be available to, or supported on that platform. 
Um, also, because of that, the ability to support issues in the XP platform will take longer, um, will require more time, become more expensive to try to address any changes. So uh, machine down will might may be down longer, um, or some of the, the needs to repair it or fix it might be more costly um, because of that. One of the most important things to consider, though, is that when you're not providing regular updates to your security, so you're not providing the regular security patches to those ATMs that Microsoft provides, then you do uh, stand to be at a risk uh, for break in PCI. PCI DSS mandates that you keep your operating system patched and up to date, and that would not be possible with Windows XP. So unless you have some compensating controls around that, that would be a risk uh, that you would need to discuss with your PCI auditors if you plan to stay on XP. Uh, and finally, Windows 7 does have some benefits over Windows XP from a technical perspective. The, the platform's been architected differently, uh, has a number of benefits uh, under the covers of, of it, so to speak, that will improve the performance, and we'll talk about those next. Um, they may not be immediately visible to anyone that walks up, but they're certainly going to be there. Um, Windows 7 is expected to perform better. Um, on the uh, platforms and hardware that I mentioned. In other words, it's optimized better to perform on that platform. It will perform more reliably. We expect it to be uh, a higher quality, if you will, and that we'll have fewer issues with some of the uniqueness that we find in, a, in an ATM network. We'll also, we'll also see some better system compatibility and connectivity. And this is really uh, low levels in the platform, but it's important. They've made some enhancements to things like USB device connectivity, TCP IP connectivity to the, to the internet, or in our cases, to the ATM network that makes these connections faster uh, to initially establish as well as to stay up better during uh, trouble with networks, uh, communication issues. So we'll see machines that are performing a little bit better because of things like that. Um, we have taken time with Windows 7 also to make sure that we've customized it for the ATM network. We've eliminated services that don't need to be there uh, to avoid problems with things uh, that aren't really part of an ATM network. You don't find the Paint app, for example, on an ATM or any of those kinds of services that aren't necessary to the performance of it. We've also hardened it, of course, to protect it against viruses, malware, and, and uh, other problems that we encounter in the world which overall lends us to better performance, uh, lower cost of ownership through higher uptime and availability. So uh, we talked about the benefits. So what are the, some of the risks of not migrating? Well, as I mentioned earlier, PCI compliance is one of the big ones. The operating system not being in, uh, in compliance can be a big issue uh, when it's time for your TR39 or your PCI audit. Um, of course, that can have ramifications far beyond just an audit report. Um, a, a break in security, uh, viruses introduced into the system or another malware attacks or card data breaches can have big impacts financially to an institution uh, in terms of losses, but it can also shake member uh, faith and, and cause them to consider moving their funds and things like this, which we never want to have happen simply because of security breaches. So it's important to maintain these levels of security for the uh, members' peace of mind as well. As I also mentioned, technical support um, becomes difficult when these systems are older and we just don't have access to uh, the kinds of support from the suppliers that we needed before. Um, it makes it difficult then to keep the, the systems up and running that we talked about. And a couple other things you can see, of course, the, the credibility for your members if your machines are not performing well. Uh, it's frustration when uh, they can't get to the systems that they need to. Um, and importantly, also, speed to market. As I said, it's, it's hard to keep up the machines just to the level that they were, but you're going to want to move those machines forward in technology. Some things that we'll talk about um, a little bit later are actually coming up on our next slide here. What's in the future? Uh, the future can't be adapted in an XP world. You'll need to be in a Windows 7 world for some of that. And so what, what kinds of things are we talking about out on the horizon to consider? And I'll talk about some of these in a little bit more detail at the end of this presentation. But things such as Diebold's concierge video service, concierge video services, I should say, excuse me, which is a, a way of having two-way video conferencing uh, with your call center and your, and your customer or consumer. Um, OptiView Re Resolve is our 
status monitoring platform, a couple of new areas in the branch also that we'll talk about that I'm very excited about uh, are 923 lobby terminals, mobile cache, and a number of these things that we see on the horizon um, are all related to being on platforms that have the support, which right now will be Windows 7. None of these things will be possible on an XP platform. So uh, usually about this point, we start to get some questions to say about, well, um, where, where do we need to go or what, what's the next steps? And, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what comes from how to start planning for that. It's just at least one more thing that I want to talk about before I do, and that's the uh, Agilus 3. I mentioned Agilus 391X earlier on, that that's the current version of ATM resident software uh, that we have today. And I wanted to just briefly mention that Agilus 3, the, the name for the most recent version, is also a re-architected version of that software from the XP platform. It's been designed to address some of these new functions that I talked about. Um, it can address the, and connect to the traditional networks that you're used to in the formats that they're used to, our 91X message protocol, uh, as well as a couple of others. It's been extended to also communicate in emerging protocols, such as the IFX standard, which is uh, something that's coming in and new on, on the market. Um, we've, a, we've also extended it to work well in multiple channels. In an, in an TCP IP environment, it's not uncommon for devices to talk to multiple hosts. Uh, this is typically not true in the ATM market, but we're starting to see it today. So things such as content management, to be able to get uh, screen updates or run management campaigns to, to particular cardholders, web services, monitoring, cache management, a number of these things re require some different connectivity than we've had in the past, and Agilus 3 is architected for that. And it's a, it's a very important part of the software to consider when you're thinking about making some changes into the future. Uh, we're not going to deal much with this in this particular webinar, but that's something important to consider you know, as we move forward into the future. So now let's talk a little bit about the steps to implementation. When you're thinking about changes, uh, migration to Windows 7, when you're thinking about migrating to EMV, um, uh, changing out to uh, you know what to plan for for uh, any of those changes or even some of the uh, encrypting pin pad changes I talked about. What are the steps? What should you really be thinking about? What are the impacts to the time frames and, and so on? Because as I said, April's coming. It's, it's not that far away. Uh, so you need to be thinking about it. We've kind of broken it down into to four steps uh, to help kind of put it into a perspective for you to kind of start some initial planning. So the first one is ATM inventory. It's always a very good idea to review the uh, inventory that you have, what ATMs are, are in your fleet, um, where they're located, what vintage uh, those machines are, how they match up to the hardware that you have uh, against the list of, of recommended. Do those machines have what's necessary to properly migrate to Windows 7? Do they have the right level of processor? For example, do they have enough memory? Um, what's the state of the hard drive? Is it uh, a seven or eight year old drive? Maybe this is the time to consider a new one, um, simply from a, a reliability or, or uh, you know, performance standpoint, durability, how many hours are left, that type of thing. So examining each machine, seeing um, what, what those things are, making note of it, uh, very important first step. From an EMV perspective, um, is this a machine that's, that's slated for conversion to EMV? Is that something that uh, is also on the plan? Because it's a very good idea at this time to, to target that as well. Look at the card reader that's located there. Uh, is it a motorized card reader? Is it an insertion dip style reader? Uh, is that the type of reader that you want to continue to have there? Um, make note of that and, and decide you know, if that should be added to the inventory list as well. Is there anything else that that machine might be desirous to have that it didn't have? Uh, is now a good time to consider uh, migrating to a touch screen or some other function? Uh, because it's always easier to make hardware changes at one time as opposed to make mul as opposed to multiple visits to a machine. So once all that's gathered, it's a good idea to sort of put that all together in a document or a spreadsheet somewhere uh, and keep keep tabs of all of that, and then have some discussions with internally as far as you know which machines get upgraded, which machines might get replaced. Uh, is this a good time to consider uh, out outsourcing that to something like Diebold's uh, Integrated Services Group 
what is the plan for all of those machines? Uh, and once that's done, then sit down from a project scheduling perspective uh, and talk to us about it or talk to your supplier about it and see what makes sense and look at the, look at the availability. We maintain a calendar of, of schedules of who and where resources are available and we can work with you to plan out uh, the proper migration, uh, scheduling it appropriately, making sure that all the resources are in the, the right places to accomplish it on time. Uh, and that's a very good next step. And then that will obviously lead to what the uh, overall investment might need, you know, to be to do that. So that would be a good step. And then step three is really the execution. And that's really based on all of those plans coming together for what gets upgraded, what gets uh, replaced, um, what gets um, perhaps just removed uh, or, or switched over to a non, uh, to an IS integrated services type of, of uh, model. There are several ways that that, that can go, uh, but it's really just the execution part of that plan. Uh, along with that, step four really then is the, the software comport of part of that. Once the hardware is done, usually at the same time or near the same time, the hardware upgrades are done. The software conversion can be done as well. That's the, um, the adding of Windows 7 or anything else. It's, it, it, the reason we call it out separately is in step four is that it's not necessary that all that be done at one time. You could begin these hardware migrations at any point because any of the hardware that I talked about will run XP um, and could then you could convert to a Windows uh, 7 at a little bit of a point in the future, uh, perhaps when your host network is ready or there may be some other concerns within the, within the credit union itself that might delay that conversion, but it's possible to lay it out as two separate and independent steps. Um, and so just a, a, a quick recap for, for us from our perspective, we've had some experience doing this uh, with others. Uh, we will try to help you in any way we can to make this migration simple. We have the software. We work with the networks like Vantif to make sure that we're prepared uh, and ready to help you and that they're prepared and ready to be uh, of, of service to you. We have the technicians and we have the support uh, and we're here to help. Okay. So um, similar kinds of things lay in place for um, things such as EMV. The processes are, are similar to the same. There is the card reader hardware and uh, different software that's required, but the steps are basically the same. So I won't go through all of that again. I know we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the EMV when we get to the questions. So what I wanted to get to next was to talk a little bit more detail about those emerging capabilities that I talked about earlier to give you some idea of what some of those were. And I, I'm not going to go back to all of them, but I wanted to highlight two or three that I thought were really important. Um, and the first one was the concierge video services. This is, um, um, I'm actually pretty surprised by, by the uh, acceptance we've seen in the marketplace from this. It's, it's been a fascinating project. Basically, it is a, a, a two-way video conversation from the ATM to a call center or a financial services expert. Uh, it is not meant to be remote control. The, the call center does not take over the transaction. It's, it's nothing like that, but it's an opportunity for you to communicate with that member uh, who may only ever visit the ATM and never come into a, a branch to be able to help them do a couple of things that they might not otherwise be able to do. For example, they may um, have, in, have a unique situation where they need to withdraw some additional funds than their daily limit. Um, and you could have this conversation with them and the, the call center could then authorize a, a, a higher limit for that day, those kinds of things. They may have lost a card uh, or need, you know, needed to address that. Or you may have uh, an, active, an activity going on that they need to communicate with or you need to communicate with them to let them know that, that their uh, loan has been approved and they need to come in and sign or there's some other, you know, uh, reason that you need to reach out and communicate to them and this allows you to do that in a unique way that that is there whenever they happen to be in front of the ATM so it's pretty interesting from that perspective it can be adapted to the existing ATMs um, and, and we're pretty excited about it uh, we think you ought to look into it and see if it has and fits in some of the business cases that you have um, second up is something really new on the market we call the Branch Performance Series. This I referred to as the Optiva 923 earlier. And this is a revolution as far as it comes to the sort of in-lobby self-service uh, for your locations. 
It's an extension. It's, it's more than a lobby ATM. This device offers a lot more functionality and performance than, than anything we've ever had before to move more routine transactions from that expensive line over to self-service. You'll, you'll see it looks different. It's laid out different, um, and it has some additional hardware and software to handle additional functionality than, than it ever did before. We'll be looking at things like coin dispensing, contactless card readers for NFC communications, barcode scanners commonly used for, for uh, reading barcodes on payment tickets to, to take loan payments or other types of payments. Um, it has a 19-inch screen there in the center to provide for uh, some uh, larger, clearer, or even unique designs uh, from a graphical standpoint. Um, it's, it's kind of like self-service. There's a teller call button here. And it's kind of like self-service from an airport is what I was going to say, from a check-in in that you, you allow people to take a little bit more control over some of the transactions that they can do by themselves. So we're really excited about this. It's become um, quite a uh, stir in the industry, and we're looking forward to uh, rolling these out in 2014. Another important area for us that I, I think is worthy of, of some discussion is what we refer to as mobile cash access. But um, this happens to be my particular favorite. I've been waiting for this for a very long time. Um, th this kind of um, technology allows you to get more mileage out of your mobile services app by allowing your, your members to use their app to pre-stage transactions at an ATM. So I can be, uh, I can be in the office or I can be um, at home. My particular dream for this is I'm fourth in line at the drive up waiting to get to the ATM and now I can use my phone to stage that transaction. So I identify which account I want my funds from, how much money I want. The, the mobile app is my authentication, so I'm not going to need to use my card here. The mobile app communicates to the, to the ATM network through some back, uh, back end integration and when I arrive at the ATM there is a, uh, an identifier on the ATM. There's a QR code that I use to uh, snap a picture of that with my phone. That tells the mobile app what ATM I'm at, and I get my cash and I'm gone. Uh, to me, I can't think of a more convenient way to combine a phone with an ATM, and uh, I'm, I'm waiting for this one myself. I've been, like I said, it's one of my favorites, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Okay, uh, so... Where are you on the path? So we've talked about a number of things here uh, into uh, and around all of these migrations. So we talked about what was coming. We talked about the benefits. We talked about some of the timelines to consider. So we've kind of come back to, uh, to our beginning. I've been talking, I don't know, for about 30 minutes or so right now. Um, and that brings us uh, uh, pretty much towards the end of what I prepared to present. So we'll show uh, back the timeline that I originally uh, started with. And uh, at this point, I think we'll be ready to stop and take some questions. Okay, great. I, perfect that we're on this timeline because that was one of the questions that we received was um, just to clarify um, the date established for compliance. And um, so if you just want to maybe um, clarify that, that, you know, is it, that it is April of 2014. Well, um, there are a couple of things about compliance on the timeline, so um, not sure what compliance we were actually speaking about. Um, so compliance for Windows 7 is obviously April. Uh, the change to PCI is also April. Uh, the migration to EMV is, is actually a little bit later. Some of those conversions don't necessarily need to happen until uh, in 2015 or 2016, depending. But um, primarily, we have been talking about April. Okay, all right, thanks. Dean, um, another question that we have here is, um, we have an ATM that currently has a dip reader. What important factors should we keep in mind if you're considering accepting EMV transactions at our ATM? Yes, uh, this is a very good question because we get asked this a lot. Um, to put that in context, uh, an EMV transaction obviously is different than a, a mag stripe transaction. In a dip reader, you insert your card into the reader and you pull it back out. The mag stripe is red when you're pulling the card back out in most cases. Um, with an EMV transaction, you insert the card into the reader, but you have to leave it in the reader because a read head um, connects to the chip that's on the edge of the card. 
So there's always some concern about a dip reader that there will be some issues with consumers inserting their card and pulling it back out uh, before the chips have a chance to connect and, and will cause some processing issues. Uh, it's often been believed that this would cause damage to the card readers and, and so should dip readers not be used, that type of thing. So my response to that is that consumers are wonderfully adaptive people and um, will learn how to use these card readers and will learn how EMV transactions work very quickly. Um, imagine where you use a mag stripe card today. You use it as uh, you use it in uh, a number of different places. So you you swipe your card at gas pumps. You use them at grocery stores and retail stores and and even in restaurants. And every time you do that, it's a different type of card reader. The orientation's different. The the way you put the the card in vertically, horizontally, stripe up, stripe down. There's a number of different ways that it happens. And with EMV, each one of those will change. And, and people will soon learn very quickly that no matter what, the card has to remain in the reader until the transaction's complete. And once that's done, then I think people will understand it will be the same at an ATM. So from a dip card reader perspective, I, I still believe a dip card reader is a viable solution for um, the ATM, and I wouldn't recommend changing it out. Um, certainly a motorized reader will um, also handle it um, and, and will work just as efficiently, but dip card readers will be fine. We'll need to make some changes to the way the screen flow works to help educate uh, members how to use it. If they put their card in and pull it out, um, it is possible to know from the mag stripe that it's a chip card, card chip, I'm sorry, it's a chip enabled card, and they could be asked to reinsert it and leave it in. And once it's in and the contacts or contact is made, the card's held in by a small pin. And so once they get past that point, it's fine. Um, there may be some other changes to consider because we don't want people leaving their cards behind, so we want to make sure to remind them to take their, to take their cards. But these are just process changes, and, and I think people will readily get adapted to it. So before I go on, one of the, one of the questions I had is, can I explain more about how EMV chips, uh, what a chip card is and how they work? So briefly, uh, I'll do that. Um, there's a lot of good information on the web about this, but Briefly, a, a chip card, if you've never seen one, is a, a standard size credit or debit card uh, plastic. It looks exactly like what you'd see today, except on the front you'll see a small metallic square located near the left end edge of the, of the card. And that square are actually a set of electrical contacts that connect to a small computer underneath them. And that computer contains the EMV application that has the uh, security features, the cryptogram, as well as the card data necessary to identify that card holder. It's not exactly track two data, but you can think about it that way. And when you insert the card into a card reader, a set of electrical contacts make contact with that chip, and they power that chip up, and they communicate to it. And so the chip sends its data to the card reader through those contacts, as well as a, a number of items called cryptograms, which are the security aspects. Uh, and the, the advantage to that is that to date, there are no known cases where an EMV chip has been duplicated. So it eliminates things like fraudulent cards um, as far as that when EMV chips are used. So it has a security benefit, um, unlike the, the E's, which mag stripes can be duplicated. So the, the card communicates to the card reader, you authorize the transaction with your PIN, things happen normally. Uh, at, the, at the end or somewhere near the end of the transaction, those cryptograms are updated and, and rewritten onto the card so that the card knows it's been used, basically, uh, one more time at that ATM. And that's the last part, and that's why the card has to remain in there, then the card can be removed. That's the basics of how an EMV operates. Okay, thanks, Dean. Um, so another question here was, um, you know, April, you mentioned April being the deadline. Is my ATM still going to run after April if I have not done my upgrade? Uh, excellent, yeah, another very good question. Um, do things come to a grinding stop? Uh, and that is not true. No, that will not happen. Um, op the operating system has no built-in shutdown. Everything will continue to operate properly um, and normally, and there will be no uh, indication in any kind that that date had passed as far as that machine goes. It's strictly about the impact of no longer being supported, no more patches, et cetera. Okay. Thank you. So 
want to remind you, if you do have any questions, you can submit them through the Q&A feature in the lower right-hand corner. Um, another question here is, will, will Diebel continue to provide maintenance on our machines that are running Windows XP after April 2014 if they are on a maintenance contract? Uh, absolutely. We, are, um, we have no intentions of leaving customers um, stranded because of this change in any way. We will continue to provide maintenance under maintenance contracts. We will continue to support, to support our own software on this platform. So we will continue to, to manage the software that we can manage. This is more about the operating system um, and, and Microsoft's withdrawal than it is anything else. If I could just ask one question of Dean, if we still have people on the line, I would appreciate it. Um, I know a lot of questions we get uh, when we talk with credit unions are, are kind of the view from 5,000 feet of what do you see happening in the U.S. market dealing with this, I guess, lack of a better term, dilemma. Um, you know, I think in the U.S. market, it's probably fair to say that the vast majority of merchants here are still only accepting MagStripe transactions. At least that's what their terminals are set up for. Uh, we certainly know that EMV is coming down the, the way, you know, is the predominant one if you go to Canada or over to Europe. But um, I think as we read all the information that's come across, we've had a number of institutions in the U.S. say, I want to consider issuing EMV cards because I know that's the way the technology is headed. But I can think of two obstacles, one being uh, all my local merchants in the immediate area where our members are going to are looking for a MagStripe transaction. So thus, if I'm looking at an EMV type card, I probably have to do a hybrid, one that has actually a MagStripe and a, uh, a chip card. But the problem that you run into as of today is, you know, the cost of that card is probably about $3, which is considerably higher than the traditional MagStripe type card. So maybe you can just kind of give us uh, your feedback in terms of what you've had with your clients of, at least in the U.S. market, uh, what do you see small, mid-sized, and larger institutions doing? Are they kind of taking a, a strategy of hold and wait? until we can see something coming from the merchants? Are you see people doing small steps in regard to EMV? And again, not looking for Diebold to take a position, but maybe give us your feedback as an industry leader of what you see your clients taking, uh, recognizing that, that market challenge as of right now. Sure, uh, Brian, it's a, it's a really good lead into a really good discussion. Um, let me preface one thing by saying uh, within the United States to, to support the migration to EMV, there is an organization referred to as the EMV Migration Forum. It's, it's part of ATMIA. Um, and I encourage people that are interested in understanding how it's evolving from a technical perspective to uh, look into that and research it. Uh, Diebold participates, a number of vendors do, but so do a lot of financial institutions and, and merchant in, and uh, retailers, for example to try to help uh, answer a lot of the questions about deploying uh, EMV in the United States. Uh, but along those lines, what are, what are uh, institutions doing? It, it falls into sort of two categories for, the, uh, for those that are early adopters. Uh, large financial institutions, those with a national footprint, um, obviously tend to be early adopters because they have uh, a lot of client base uh, and they have a, you know, a, a longer road to get down in these conversions. Um, and, and have the ability to move early. So we're seeing larger accounts, the, the Bank of America type of account, uh, Chase, Wells Fargo, those kinds, uh, starting to make their plans for migration, uh, at least from an, uh, an ATM and you know, uh, kind of perspective. As far as their issuance goes, I think they're, they're, they're going a little bit slower on the card issuance side, as you said, kind of wait and see how things uh, shake out from a, a technical standpoint. Um, they may, they are offering in some cases special programs to global travelers who, who may need access to an EMV type chip because they find themselves uh, traveling to Europe uh, or other areas where MagStripe is becoming predominantly more difficult to deal with. Uh, but as you come down in, in size, you, you also see sort of more delay in both sides. So I think um, it's going to be a slow migration in the United States because it is a, it is a, um, sort of timed event between merchants and, and financial institutions. And I don't think it's the case of which one leads the other. I think they're both in, sort of hand in hand in this migration together. Thank you. Okay. All right. Well, 
Um, if that's all the questions that we have, I don't see any others coming in. We'll go ahead and um, end our session for today. And once again, thank you for joining us and have a great day.